recording started. All right, welcome to the Manhattan GMAT Study Hall, March 3rd edition. Um, today's topic is going to be indicated on the board, strength and weaken questions, and evaluate the argument type questions. So these are these have been very popularly requested. I'm going to try, as usual, to minimize the overlap between these question types and our coverage of the nine session class. So hopefully not too many of these points will be repeated. Before we get started, as usual, we have to go ahead and give you the warnings that we always give you. So here goes that. Um, the kinds of problems that you should and should not submit. Please don't submit problems that are too general. Some people are still doing this. Some people are submitting problems that are like, how do I do critical reasoning? Or how do I do modifiers or something like that? Topics that are too broad. Um, please don't do that. Please narrow your topic to something that could reasonably be the topic of a study hall. And moreover, if people are asking, if you are one of the people who are asking these very overly broad questions, um, hopefully you realize that you've got the wrong outlook on the whole test. Like if you're asking about critical reasoning as a whole, then it means you're not really thinking about critical reasoning the way you should be, which is every question type is a completely different enterprise. So you've got to keep that in mind. If you're asking questions that are really super broad in general, not only are they things we can't really use in the study hall, but they don't even really make sense as questions if they're too broad. Also, th this is what tends to be the real problem that people have. Um, please don't submit problems that are too specific. Like about 30 or 40 percent of the submissions that we get are, are way too specific for the study hall. We, we get submissions where people send us one question with one question about that question. Like, why is choice B wrong here? Or tell me about example two on page 94 in this strategy guide. Those kinds of things are not what this study hall is for. Those kinds of things are why we have forums. So if you have a question that is super, super duper specific, please post it on the forums and not uh, here in the study hall. Those are manhattangmat.com slash forum. Also, personal issues, please don't submit those. Please don't give me a, a, a submission that's like, here's my current score, here's my goal score, what do I do? This is not the place for that. So there's also a place on the forums for that as a general questions folder. That's where you should post that kind of thing. So what do we want, and if it's an admissions question, then we have an ask admissions consultant folder. What should we see? Please submit topics that are of intermediate scope. So not too general, not too specific. So don't ask about all critical reasoning at once, but also don't ask about one critical reasoning problem. So instead, today's topic is a nice middle point. This is a specific enough topic that it would work for a study hall. If you're talking about math, please don't ask about the entire quant section. Please don't ask about one problem. Instead, be like, what do I do with the median? Or what do I do with this type of problem? If you do post a specific problem, remember specific problems belong in the forum. If you're going to post a specific problem here, please include some sort of generalized question about that problem. Otherwise, we'll just expect you to post it on the forum. Finally, you cannot give us problems from the official guide for the study hall. We cannot do them. We have the same issue with copyright as we do on the forums. We are only allowed to use sources here that we would also be allowed to use on the forum. So no official guide and no unsourced problems. You can't send us a problem if you don't tell us where it is from. If you do, we will just have to ignore it. Okay, those are the rules. Smiley face icon if you understand these rules, and we'll move on for submissions and so on. Okay, good. Let's look at the next page, which is, again, please check the archives. Some people are requesting things that are already listed as topics in the archive. For example, in the last couple of weeks, we had someone request a session on probability, even though we 
just did a session on probability a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had someone else request a session on assumption questions. We, all, we already had one of those. We had someone else submit a couple other things that we've already covered. So please, the same page where you sign up for this study hall and the same page where you submit questions, if you scroll downward just a little bit, you will see a list of archive recordings. Please check that list to see whether we have already covered what you are going to submit as a question. Because um, we don't really want to be redundant here. We want to keep presenting you with material that is new. So with that in mind. Okay, let's go ahead and get started on this. Today's topic again is strength and weaken question. And later we're going to talk about the evaluate the argument type question. What we're going to start out with is a very simple example. And here's that simple example. Instead of a question and five choices, I'm just going to give you a question with one answer choice. And you guys are going to tell me whether you think that one answer choice is correct or not. So, okay. Here's the passage. The passage is this. The unemployment rate in the new city area jumped from 5% to 9% last month. Therefore, the local economy of the new city area is in trouble. Okay. Answer choice. Let's say the question that we're going to ask here is which of the following most weakens the above argument. And let's say we have this answer choice, just one answer choice. The answer choice is New City is home to a large state university that graduated 20,000 students last month. Okay, what you should see somewhere on your screen is you should see this. You should see these buttons. They should be over there somewhere next to where the names and such things are listed. If you think this is a correct answer choice to this question, click on the check mark. If you think this would be an incorrect answer choice to this question, please click on the red X. Everybody. Okay, we got responses from about two-thirds of you. Non-response from about three or four. Um, there's a Michelle, a Mindy, a Praveen that we're waiting to hear from. Okay, remember, it's a GMAT. You've got to make decisions. So, okay. All right, here we go. There's still a uh, – Praveen, I saw your clicks. It was, it was legit. Um, so in fact, I saw it go on and off a few times. So I think you did click it. All right. Um, here's the responses from the group. So it looks like we're definitely going to be doing some learning today. Oops, clicking the wrong thing. Um, here are the here's the results from the class. But this would be a correct answer to this problem. So it, it looks like we're actually going to be learning something today here. So this would be correct. This is a weakener to the above passage. Let's talk about why. This is a weakener. Let's have you guys uh, weigh in on this a little bit. Go ahead and type in the text box some explanation for how this is a weakener. See if you guys can give some opinion or give some enlightenment here. A couple of you are typing. How, how does this work? How is this how does this answer choice weaken? OK. 
Okay, someone says more graduates, less unemployment rate. That is not it because it's a fact that the unemployment rate has increased. So, and if there's someone else type, there are more applicants but fewer jobs. If that's true, then the economy is in trouble because that means that you're going to have permanent unemployment. But okay. So here's and the question that's being asked by Michelle in the box, we, we need to address that as well. So here's the story. The story is that this choice, here's the, the mechanism by which this weakens the argument. So the mechanism by which this weakens the argument is, okay, the argument says, that there's a fact, the fact is that there's an increase in unemployment. We can't touch facts. So we know there was an increase in unemployment. We cannot attack this fact. Instead, what we need to, what we need to argue is the line of reasoning. The claim is that this increase signifies actual economic trouble. Okay, this is what we need to attack, is this claim. Because we can't, uh, you can't attack facts in these arguments. You can only attack claims. So yeah, there's an intrigator who says the, the city is in trouble because of the increase in unemployment rate. Yeah, I mean, so this is the, the link that we can attack. Because you cannot attack facts. Not possible to challenge facts. So the only thing you can challenge is the interpretation of facts, but you cannot challenge the facts themselves. So the point is, the way this works is that if the above answer choice is true, then the unemployment numbers have gone up for reasons that do not signify economic trouble. Now, one thing that you've got to notice here is we are making assumptions when we do this. Okay, so we have a couple of, let me actually cut and paste a couple of questions. Let me kill these graphics over here. Okay. So here's how, the, here's how this works. And let me actually, okay. Let me get a couple of questions out of the text box and put them on the screen because those are what we need to talk about. There's one of them. Here's another one. Okay, here are two among others of the questions that were posted in the text box. Here's one of them, here's another one. What are we doing here? What, we are making assumptions about this. So let's talk about the assumptions that we're making and let's talk about why we are making those assumptions. So what we're doing here is this. Not all may have resided in New City after graduating. So we are assuming the following. The first thing is that we are assuming that at least a sizable number of, like some significant number of the graduates stayed in the local area. In other words, they didn't all leave. They didn't all leave in overwhelming numbers. And we also have to assume that the other assumption that we're making here that you guys didn't address in the box, but it's another assumption that we're making is that we're assuming that not all of these graduates are immediately employed. So let me look through the text box and see what else who um, 
someone is saying, can we assume that local economy is in trouble if the rate increases? Well, no, you can't, because if you could, then this would be a fact. But if you could assume that, then there would be, it would be impossible to weaken this argument, because if that, if that were an assumption, then this conclusion would be automatic. Okay. Um, we need to assume these two things. For this, to, for this connection to work, we have to assume that some of these graduates stayed in the area and that not all of them were employed immediately. So the point here is this, and this is going to come as a shock to people who are used to the kind of thinking that you use on draw the conclusion and so on. But on strength and weaken problems, you need to interpret statements in the most probable or most reasonable way. Like, common sense sort of way. This is not something that you do on other question types. This is absolutely not, for example, something that you would do on draw to conclusion questions. But you have to make the most probable assumptions about stuff. In other words, you have to interpret statements the way that sort of common sense people on the street would interpret them. So for instance, you need to interpret something about whether these people are leaving town or not. So the most probable interpretation is not everybody leaves. Because if you don't make this assumption, you have to make the assumption that everyone does leave, which is a lot less reasonable. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to assume that everyone leaves, 20,000 people. Also, you, you do have to make the assumption that not all of the graduates are employed right away, because otherwise they wouldn't affect this number. But again, this is a much more reasonable interpretation than to assume that all of them are immediately employed. So these questions are not strictly formal logic. This is the one thing you really, really, really have to understand. These questions do require you to think like a real world mentality and use a certain amount of common sense to narrow the possibilities down. So you can't think like you're thinking in a classroom. You have to think the way that you would out on the street. So um, the question with the text box. I mean, yeah, there, there's an argument. There's an assumption in this argument, yeah. So the author assumes that the unemployment rate means trouble. And so that's what you're trying to shoot down, yeah. The other text box question says, can we assume this? The answer is no, we can't. Otherwise, there would be no weakening. But yeah, this argument has an assumption that this orange thing is true, which is what we're attacking. So does everybody understand this concept of interpreting statements in the most probable way? Smiley face, if this makes sense to you, and if you understand why these are the best assumptions to make in the situation at hand. So, um, Samara, yeah, but this is written in the present. So, I mean, we're saying this is the current state of the economy. I mean, if you, you can't really do something like that because this is talking about what's going on right now. So that kind of statement doesn't make any sense in this time context. Um, OK. Here, here's the story. There's a very broad spectrum of the way that you can interpret statements. It's a useful way of thinking about these problems on this test, spectrum of ways in which to interpret statements. On one end of the spectrum, you have the very intuitive, if you know what these words mean, it, it, it's very inductive. It's very real world type thinking. It makes plausible assumptions, makes most probable common sense assumptions. And more, most importantly, it, it is not using formal logic. Like this end of the spectrum is not 
formal logic. The other end of the spectrum is very literal and very hard mathematical, you know, like formal. Not real world thinking at all. Not in the least bit. This kind of thinking doesn't make any additional assumptions that are not stated. Doesn't use any sort of common sense. And uses formal logic. The point here is that the different types of problems that show up in the verbal section are on different ends of this spectrum. For instance, draw the conclusion questions are way, 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 way over here. So, e.g., draw the conclusion questions. I mean, on the other hand, a lot of other questions, including our beloved strength and weaken questions, are all the way over on the other side. What they're testing is they're testing your, your way of thinking in this more intuitive, real world kind of way. So, strength and weaken questions. The point when you think about this test is that you have to realize that, that each question type is over at one extreme or the other of these. And you have to realize which extreme you are at. Because thinking in the way of the other extreme is not going to get you anywhere. Like if you try to use intuitive common sense thinking for draw the conclusion questions, it will not work. Draw the conclusion questions are all about formal deductions. On the other hand, if you try to approach strength and weaken questions with formal logic, you will not get any of them right because that's not what they are testing. So like what the, the objective of the GMAT here is to, is to test your thinking skills in both of these arenas. So that in other words, anyone approaching the critical reasoning section with only this kind of thinking is going to be out of luck because you're going to get all of these wrong. Also, anybody approaching the critical reasoning section with only this kind of thinking is similarly going to be out of luck because the questions that require formal logic, you're dead. So your job is to realize, your job is to realize which of these types of thinking is relevant to the question type that you are currently dealing with and use it. So and in order to do this, what you are going to have to do is you're going to have to read the question prompt first. Again, I addressed this point last time. There's a book out there which, I'm not supposed to name it, but there's a book out there which while it's a good book in most other ways, it tells you that you should read the passage before the question, and that's very, very bad advice because you don't know how to read, the, because you don't know how you're supposed to be reading that passage until you read the question. So what I'm saying is, if this is an example of a passage, um, here's the passage we looked at last time, you need to read this first. Because this tells you how you should be reading the passage. This tells you which of the above styles you should use in interpreting the passage. In other words, you don't know whether you need to read this in a very literal, very sort of nitpicky kind of way, or if you should just read it for the gist of the argument until you read the question. So when you read this question type and it says which of the following weakens the argument, you know that your job is to read for the general principles and use your intuition to see what affects the argument. So once you read the question type and you've settled on a type of reasoning to use, then you go to the passage and you read the passage with that sort of, that sort of type 
have thinking in mind. So like, let me illustrate this with a, a particular statement that, I mean, theoretically the statement would be part of a passage. It's not really part of a passage. I'm just going to isolate it. But let's say, if I'm going to copy the spectrum stuff over to the next page. Like, let's say you had the following statement. Say a passage contains the following statement. The statement is a patient was brought to an emergency room with injuries consistent with having been hit by a cop. Okay, there's a statement. Let's say there's a statement in the passage. If you are reading this passage as part of a strength and weaken question, then how should you interpret this statement? What is the most probable interpretation of this? If you see this in a passage, text box, please. Like, what does this most probably mean? It most probably means was hit by a cop. That's what it means. So if you are using this kind of thinking, if you're doing, if you see this kind of statement in a strength and weaken question, with this type of reasoning, you interpret this statement as the patient, and you don't interpret it as maybe. That's the whole point. You interpret it as, this is what I can assume. The patient was hit by a cop. Because this is the most probable common sense interpretation of this. And that's how you have to process this. Like, if you're thinking only in terms of formal logic, then you can be like, okay, I don't know if they were hit by a car or not. But that's the point. The test is trying to filter out people who only think in terms of formal logic. Because, frankly, people who think only in terms of formal logic are not good at management. So since this is the GMAT and it's a business school test, they are purposely trying to get rid of people who only think in this way. Similarly, they're also trying to get rid of people who only think this way. But um, that's the point that most people have trouble with that we see on forums and so on is thinking too formally all the time about everything. Big, big problem on these. Um, your consistent injuries by itself doesn't mean anything. Um, it's injuries that are consistent with this, meaning injuries that are the type of injuries that you would have if you had been hit by a cop. So the point is, like, if you saw this in a draw the conclusion question, it would be totally different. Like, if you see this in a conclusion type question with this type of reasoning, then you would have to think about stuff like, you have to think about things like, well, what other sort of thing may have produced such injuries? I don't really 100% know that the patient was hit by a cop. The point is that you, you, in these kinds of problems, you don't make the common sense assumptions, and so you would have to think about stuff like this. In strength and weaken problems, you have to make plausible common sense assumptions. So you can do this. Similarly, in this problem, you have to go ahead and assume that these graduates, some of them are in town, and some of them had to look for jobs for a while. And those are the best assumptions because the other possibilities are sort of remote. So the deal then is, as a reminder, we're going to look at a few examples now. 
but when you do strength and weaken problems, you need to use intuitive thinking. The overall argument, especially the relationships between the statements, is much, much more important than the details. And again, most importantly, when you read statements in the passage and in the answer choices, you need to, you can make common sense assumptions and you can interpret statements in the most probable real world sort of way. Most probable assumption. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and make an abbreviation for this because we're going to be talking about this a lot in the problems that follow. So in the rest of this study hall, I'm going to use this abbreviation. I'm going to use the abbreviation MPI for most probable interpretation. So the MPI most probable interpretation of a statement. The MPI of this statement is that some of these graduates are still in town, enough of them to make a difference, and they don't all have jobs. That's the MPI of the statement. The MPI of this statement is the patient was really hit by a car. Again, these are not things that are certain. But very few things are certain. I mean, that's why there are so many of these problems with tests, because it's business. I mean, business is not really the kind of situation where you really use formal logic very much. It's very rare. Um, unless you're a lawyer, you don't really use much formal logic at all. Instead, this is, this is what you do all day long. You take statements about the business and about the climate in which you're doing business, and you say, what does this most probably mean? You know, like if you're a physical bookstore and you see fewer and fewer sales and more and more people buying books on Amazon, you don't use this kind of logic and say, well, maybe I'm not 100% sure that people are going from physical to electronic books. You know, maybe it's just some crazy numbers. You don't do that. You say, MPI, okay, look, people are stopping buying physical books and they're starting to buy more and more ebooks. What do I do? So this is much more like the kind of reasoning that you use in business, and that's why it is on this tab. So, but another thing about these problems, this is what you do do. What you don't do is you don't use formal logic. Don't worry about the following. Don't worry about trying to classify problems. Or especially don't worry about trying to find general rules because you won't find them. Again, that's why there are that's why there are so many of these problems on the test because there are not general rules that will generate answer choices. They don't exist. So that then this is precisely the reason why they test these things so much. So rules, they don't exist. You won't be able to find them. You have to treat these problems on a one-by-one -one basis using MPIs, most probable interpretation. Smiley face if you guys are ready to try some. Okay, good. So let's take a look. Try this. Okay, by the way, what, please do not answer these in the text box. You will see this thing in the corner of the, over there on the left hand side. Please use these things to indicate your answer. I'm going to give you about a minute and a half on the timer.
Okay, only about one third of you have actually answered this thing. So please indicate and answer. We're waiting on, I don't know how to pronounce some of these names, but there's a, a child, a, a Dinesh just logged back in, um, and a Rumana. Five more seconds, please indicate some sort of answer. Remember, if you are one of the two people who hasn't answered yet, this is the GMAT. You cannot delay on these things. You have to indicate some sort of answer. Okay. Remember, the buttons are over there. Um, as it says on the screen, please answer with the buttons. Please do not type your answers in the text box. Okay, here's the class's answers. So this one went pretty well. The correct answer is E. Let's talk about it. So the, the main deal here in this argument is, again, you're reading this for the big picture. You're not reading this for, for minute details. So the, this means since you are reading these things not for the details but for the big picture. You don't really, like if there are numbers, don't pay attention to the numbers. If there are statistics, don't pay attention to the actual statistics. Instead, what's the relationship? So if there are numbers or statistics, the numbers themselves are not the point. Instead, you should be looking at the relationships between or among the figures. So the point of the average age of cars, like, okay, someone tell me in the text box, what is the point of this statement, this thing? Like, wh who cares? Like, wh what, what is that, what point is that trying to get across? Yeah, people are driving around older cars, or they're hanging out of their cars for longer is the point. So the seven and the nine are not what is important. It's it's just the point that people are driving around in, in older cars. So the Brown statement means people are driving older cars on average. So Car manufacturers claim that the poor economy has forced people to put off buying new cars. And thus, when the economy improves, the average age of cars will return to form of that. So in other words, the, the argument that the manufacturers are claiming the manufacturers are saying the economy is the only real reason here. So when the economy gets better, people will buy newer cars again. Okay, but this is this is the argument. So. The only thing in here that we can really attack is, I mean, th this is a fact, so we can't go after this. This is a fact. Like, if the average age of cars is bigger, then the, if the average age of cars is more age, more years, then that's what it is. So that's fact. But this is an assumption that the manufacturers are making, so we can come after that with, with these statements. So fewer cars are being manufactured than were being manufactured five years ago, that, that doesn't really have to do with how old the people's cars are. Because this is, this is the manufacturing end. This is not the consumer end of things. So for this to be a factor, you would have to assume that, that people are not buying cars because they can't, which is not really a reasonable interpretation of this. This one, B, actually goes hand in hand with this. I mean, this is, this is the economy causing people to do this. So if B is true, 
then it will actually strengthen. Um, remember that call into question, if you don't know this, a couple of you picked these choices. Call into question means weaken. Or present evidence against. So make sure you know that. I mean, it doesn't sound like it means that. Call into question sounds like it means just question something. But call into question specifically means the weaken an argument. So, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, A is not really a strengthener or a weakener because A is not related directly to this. Like, the, the, the fewer cars being manufactured there, there's just way too many variables going on there. Like, first of all, we're just talking about the cars that people drive there. I mean, that doesn't have to mean cars that are manufactured in the country. I mean, like, A could reasonably also just mean that more cars are being imported. So, and then also, yeah, there's not a direct relationship between manufacturing and sales either. And finally, um, this is not really an economic factor. Like, this, this decision could be driven by other things besides economic indicators. So, like, for A, you'd have to make four or five different assumptions, some of which are not necessarily MPI. Um, C, it doesn't matter. I mean, C is a reason not to drive older cars, but people are driving older cars. So C is kind of irrelevant because it's a fact that people are driving the older cars. So you can't argue with this. This is a fact. So it doesn't matter what the pluses and minuses of driving older cars are because the fact is that people are driving older cars, period. So that's not the material of the argument. Um, D would be, if anything, a reason why new cars would be better. I mean, it's, well, someone's talking about out of scope. You got to be careful with that because notice that the correct answers to these questions Let's go back to this one real quick. I mean, this is also very much out of scope of the argument. In fact, the correct answers have to be outside the scope of the argument. Because if you, so let's put that in the yes row here. You need a choice. You actually have to select a choice. If something is the correct answer, it will be outside the scope. Select a choice that is in at least one way outside the scope of the argument. You need a choice that is outside the scope of the argument. You need that. Because otherwise, if you think about what strengthen or weaken means, okay, like let's say I tell somebody, hey, you should move to Las Vegas because the weather is great and it's a fun town. If that person tells me I need to strengthen my argument, that means I need to give him more reasons to go to Vegas, like the reasons that I have not already given. So outside the scope is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. I mean, the question of whether it's relevant is a different question, but there's no systematic way of being able to tell that. You have to use your most probable interpretations and see whether it has anything to do with it. So. D, though, D is an advantage of newer cars. So, yeah, you need to bring a new fact. Exactly. Um, this is an advantage of cars that are newer. So, if anything, that intensifies the, the, you know, it's not very directly related to anything here. But if anything, it makes this even more significant that people are driving older cars because new cars are cheaper. But E, okay. The most probable interpretation of E, if, mo if most people believe this, then the most probable way to interpret this statement is that they will what? Tax box, please. How do you, how do you interpret this statement? Yeah, most greater than 50%, yeah, fine. But remember, these arguments don't have to do with statistics. I mean, 
you have to make an assumption about what these people will, will do. Yeah, you need to assume that they will not start buying new cars again, regardless of the economy. So the, the most, pro it doesn't need to be everybody, but the most probable interpretation is at, at, a, at least a good proportion of these people, a significant proportion of these people will act on what they believe. So a significant proportion of these people will not replace their old cars with new ones, regardless of the economy. I mean, this is not formal logic. Again, if you are stuck in formal logic robot mode, you might look at this and be like, well, how do I know they're not all going to buy new cars, even though they have these beliefs? You have to use your most probable interpretation. The most probable interpretation is that if most people think that buying a new car is a really bad thing to do, then at least a lot of those people are not actually going to do it. This is a very reasonable assumption. And assuming the opposite of this is not reasonable. So this is how you have to interpret this statement. Again, it is not an exercise in formal logic, and it is not intended to be one. Questions about this? Everybody understand how this works? If you have a question, type in the text box. If you understand how this problem works, give me the smiley face icon. Okay. Doesn't look like anyone is typing a question. So let's move on to another one. Try someone says it doesn't seem intuitive that the newer cars have worse ecological consequences. It doesn't matter because we're saying this is a fact. Okay, like the things in the statements are facts. Like you need to interpret those as a most probable statement. Also, it doesn't matter if they do or not. It only matters what people believe because the, the upshot of this is that people's action is they will not buy as many new cars. So Intrilligator, even if this fact is dead false, we do not care because the statement says people in this country believe that it's true, and we don't care if the fact is true or not. We care what people will do as far as buying cars. So, I mean, if they don't buy new cars because they think new cars are infested with demons, still, still valid, still means they won't do it. So you got to think about what matters and what doesn't matter. Okay, let's try another problem. Go ahead and try this one right here. Again, please answer with the buttons. Please do not answer in the text box. Thank you. Okay, here's a timer. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to pick something pretty soon. Um, most people at the beginning of the alphabet were still waiting on you. Um, Cecily, Charmaine, Dinesh, Rumana. Remember, it's the GMAT. you got to pick something. And now you're over 215. So we're still waiting for Dinesh and Rumana. Just even if you have to randomly guess, you should randomly guess. At the pace that we're talking about with these last couple of people, you won't finish the test. So make sure that you actually guess things. Okay. Um, here's the class statistics. Let's take a look. Um, we're sort of more all over the place on this one, although the correct answer is the most popular one. So let's take a look. Here's the deal. All right, let's, let's simplify this argument. Let's take a look. Kernland imposes a high tariff on the export, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So there's tariff on their cashews. If the tariff were listed, then more farmers could profit. So if we're talking about two consequences of removing the tariff, the argument says if the tariff were removed, um, more farmers could profit, but 
fewer, like the processing plants couldn't employ as many people. Because this is what, you, you got to figure that out from this statement. Since the processing, we're talking about unprocessed cashews are sold. That means we're not processing them. They're unprocessed. Since all the processing plants are in the city, if you take away the tariff, it'll hamper the government's effort to reduce urban unemployment. I mean, th there's an implicit step in there, which is if you sell unprocessed cashews, then the processing plants will have to lay people off, and therefore unemployment, blah, 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 blah. So that's the deal. The conclusion that the argument is getting from this is, therefore, hamper the government's effort to reduce unemployment. Um, what does this mean in simpler terms? Can anybody in the text box explain that blue thing in words that are less bulky than that? Can anybody explain that in words that are a little bit more friendly? Hamper the effort to reduce unemployment. Hamper means to like get in the way of something or slow it down. At least one of you is saying the opposite of what this is. Remember, the government is trying to reduce unemployment in the city. So hampering that means that this will make what happen to unemployment. A couple of you are typing. Yeah, it'll make it go up. Yeah, exactly. Because it'll, i.e., this situation will increase or contribute, at least it'll contribute to increasing urban unemployment. So, I mean, they expected you to get that out of this statement. Um, it's, it, it, the point is that this variable, they're saying, is going to contribute to increasing it. I mean, it might not make the overall level increase, but it'll be something that creates more unemployment. It'll create more unemployment. So um, I don't know what missed means, but if you want to write more words, that's good. So this means, yeah, i.e., it'll create, it'll create more unemployment. So let's look at this. Some of the byproducts are used for manufacturing paints and plastics. By the way, what what's best to do now? is you should temporarily ignore whether it says strengthen or weaken. Very important point. Temporarily don't think about this. Don't think about which way this should go. Just evaluate the choices by themselves. Then go back to the question and see whether it, which way you're trying to go. Because if you have in mind the whole time that if you if you have in mind the whole time I'm trying to weaken the argument, you might try too hard to make things weaken the argument. But if you're just looking at these on a neutral basis and saying what do they do, then you will conclude that they, you know, you'll make more accurate judgments. The way you get it couldn't employ as many people is because you're, otherwise this blue statement would make no sense. Like we, we need to, the reasoning is we're not processing as many more cashews, and so we have process. I mean, the most probable interpretation of this is if you are not processing as many nuts, then you will have to lay people off. It, it, it's an MPI. It's the most probable interpretation. It means that we are not processing as many nuts anymore. So the processing factories won't have as much work to do. But yeah, you have to figure it out. They don't state it explicitly. It's the most probable interpretation. Okay. Um, 
some of the byproducts of processing cashews, we don't care. This, does, this doesn't matter. Other countries in which cashews are processed, we don't care what other countries do. We only care what Kirtland does. More people are engaged in farming than processing. This, the comparison of numbers doesn't contribute to this issue. Buying unprocessed cashews enable cashews processors to sell processed nuts at competitive prices. This is something that they can still do if we don't process as many nuts, but this doesn't address the unemployment issue. On the other hand, what E does, if you're driving farmers off their land and into the cities, it's actually a lot like, it's almost the same situation you had with those college grads. You, you, the, most probable in, the most probable interpretation of this is that a lot of these guys will be unemployed when they get to the city. So, most probable interpretation, many of these farmers will be unemployed when they get to the city. So what this means is that if you don't do this, then farmers will drift into the city and become unemployed. So the way this weakens the argument, this is the correct answer, the way that this weakens the argument is, like, we, we're not even questioning that unemployment will be created if we do lift the tariff. But what this says is that even if we don't, because farmers are not profiting, they're still creating unemployment. So the idea is that it's unemployment either way. The other way you could think about it is this. If this is true, then removing the tariff means more farmers could make a profit, which would mean fewer of them will drift into the city, according to choice E. Fewer of them will drift into the cities and become unemployed. And so that's going to have a direct negative effect on unemployment instead of a positive effect. No, fewer of them will. So according to choice E, if you do this, then you will be reducing the number of farmers that drift into the cities and become unemployed. So in other words, that gives a negative effect on unemployment, which will help to balance or cancel out this positive effect. So none of the other choices really have an MPI that has anything to do with unemployment. Okay, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, again, you can see what we mean about most probable interpretations, MPIs, whatever you want to call them. Like, they, you need to make them. You, you, have, to, you have to make these interpretations of the statements. Okay, let's try one more. Let's try this. And then we'll talk about the, uh, after this, we'll talk about those evaluate types. So again, please use the buttons to answer the question. Here is a timer. Okay, timer's up. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Um, as far as really, really hard ones go, someone is saying, can we try a really hard one? Um, that really varies from student to student. Like, the last one was pretty hard for the group. We were kind of all over on that one. Okay. Um, Natasha, Romana, we're still waiting on you, too. Okay, so here is, you guys did a very good job on this one, so we're going to um, 
move on quickly, but let's do a quick discussion. It, the deal here is that, um, okay, here's, the, here's the, the story with the big picture of this argument is this. Um, Northern Air depends for its success on the economy and a quick turnaround. So it depends on quick turnaround. And so it is planning to replace its large planes with sky buses. So the fuel efficiency results in lower fuel costs and reduced time spent refueling. So this is a fact, like we can't question the fact that it's reduced refueling time and we can't question the fact that it's, like this is, these, these are facts. So you can't, anything about fuel costs isn't really relevant, anything about refueling is not really relevant because it talks about these things. These are facts, but you can't touch these. So the point is that the big picture of the argument is that they depend, they need faster, they need these planes to get off the runway faster. So the big picture is the issue at hand is will the sky buses really get off the runway faster? So the pro here is lower fuel cost and reduced refueling time. So, and economy. So economy has to do with lower fuel costs and quick turnaround has to do with reduced time spent refueling. So will they get off the runway faster and or cost less? So if you were going to strengthen this thing, like if you have get off runway faster or cost less, then that's a strengthening. But if you have get off the runway slower or cost more, then that's a weakening. So A is it'll cost less. So and it'll be a direct flight, which means you don't even have to get on the runway in the first place. Like this is even better than getting off the runway faster. This is you don't even have to use the runway. So A is strengthening. We, we like A as a friend. Okay, aviation fuel this is projected to decline in price. This means that they're going to cost less. But this is not a strengthener because this is not sky buses costing less. This is everything costing less. So if everything costs less overall, then we don't care. Um, the fuel efficiency will cost it to eliminate refueling. That's a strengthener. I mean, mechanics jobs, unfortunately, are not part of this argument. And then none of them are considering buying sky buses. This is irrelevant because the argument is about the merits of the sky bus itself, not about whether the competitors are doing the same thing. Because it doesn't say that they depend on being more economical or quicker than competitors. It just says they need these things to absolutely be true, not relatively. But this is, it'll cause turbulence that force other planes to delay their takeoffs. This means that it will get off the runway slower because they've taken a long time. So this is a weakness. Uh, it's supposed to be a W, not a P. Okay. Any questions about that? If you have questions about that, go ahead and type. So the correct answer here would be E. We want the one that weakens. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. Now let's take a look at a new a new type of question that is not a new type of question. Let's take a look at the so-called genre of evaluate the argument question. 
which would help us evaluate the argument questions. What we're going to show you is that these are really just the, exactly the same thing as what we're already doing. These are really just more strength and weakening questions. So uh, let me show you. Um, let, let me show you with a simple, simple example. So let's go. Let's do another really simple passage. Here's a simple passage. I have 12% body fat. My friend has 9% body fat. Therefore, my friend has fewer pounds of body fat than I do. Okay. Um, does anybody see where you could strengthen or weaken this argument? If you do, type in the text box. If there's any issue in this argument that you could strengthen or weaken, tell me what that is. Yeah, it's a percent versus a real number. So what, what additional consideration would, yeah, you need the actual weights to compare. So. Sample answer for strengthen would be something like my friend's body weight is close to mine. Because then if you take if you take twelve percent and nine percent of similar numbers, then um, you're looking at less with the nine percent. On the other hand, sample answer for weaken would be something that's the opposite. If my friend weighs a lot more than I do. So my friend weighs substantially more than I do. Again, remember, strength and weaken questions are not going to be, like, they're not going to be, like, quant. If this were quant, you would figure out that if my friend weighs more than, like, four-thirds of what I do, then he's going to have more body fat. But this is not quant. You don't have to figure out the exact proportions here. All you got to do is realize that the thing that you're taking a percentage of is an issue here. So once you realize that, you're good. So now here's the new question type. And what you're going to discover with these examples is that it's really not a new question type at all. So sample answer for which of these would help us evaluate the argument. It's really the same as what we already have here, but it's just not decisive. That's the difference. So like the relative body weights of me and my friend. Or something like something like whether my friend weighs substantially more than I do. So I mean, it, it, what you can see by looking at these examples is that these types of questions are really not different questions at all. But, like they're really just the same thing, except instead of giving you something as a definitive statement, they give it to you as a whether or a could be yes or could be no kind of thing. So these are really the same. Smiley face if you see what I'm talking about. And not in other face if you don't. But like the only difference is that evaluate questions don't tell you which way the statement comes. So OK. Here's the story then. If you get a question like this, if you get a which would help us evaluate the argument question, the best way to handle these is just to like take the indecisive statement 
usually but not always starting with whether. Make it decisive. Just make it go one way or the other. So, e.g., if you had, for example, if you had whether the patient normally gets adequate sleep, just make this the patient normally gets adequate sleep. Or make it the patient doesn't normally get adequate sleep. Okay. Just make it like that. Make it one of those statements and then see how it affects the argument. Then if the statement produces either strengthen or weaken, then it helps to evaluate. Because you don't know which, I mean, either way, as long as it helps you figure it out in either direction. So in practice, what you're going to see in these things is you're either going to see four neutrals and a strengthen or four neutrals and a weaken. Or it's kind of rare, but if you had which one of these would not help us evaluate, then you would have one irrelevant factor and four that were either strength and a weak. But so let's take a look at these, knowing that we know now, knowing that these are basically exactly the same thing as strength and weak, and they just don't make the decision for you. You you have to make the decision yourself. So let's go ahead and look at one. Um, I see one person is typing. No, okay, not. All right, let's take a look at at least a couple of these until we run out of time. Why don't you try this? Please answer with the buttons. I will be back in two minutes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, let's get an answer to this pretty soon, please. Okay, still got a couple people who don't have answers, so let's take a look. All right, so here's the story. The answer that most people picked here is incorrect, and I'm not surprised, and that's part of the reason I picked this question. Um, C is not correct. Let's talk about why not. Um, here's the deal. The argument says until the cost of extracting uranium from seawater can somehow be reduced. So this means that we don't care about extracting uranium from seawater because that's been excluded from the argument. Like the argument says that, okay, you can get uranium from seawater but it's more expensive, it's a lot more, it's more expensive than uranium to mine. Like, therefore, uranium from seawater won't be commercially viable unless the cost of, unless its cost goes down. 
that means that this has already this has already been accounted for. So talking about the cost of uranium going down doesn't matter because this is already in the argument. The argument already accounts for this. So like, if I say something like you can't, um, you know, you, you can't buy a Ferrari unless you're rich. If you tell me that lots of rich people are buying Ferraris, that doesn't affect my argument because I've already allowed for that. So in other words, if you have blah, 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 will not happen unless X, then X is not a strengthener or a weakener because X is in the argument already. So what you could, one way to think about it is in that sort of common sense way. The other way to think about it is just to realize, again, that things that are in the scope of the argument are not correct answers. So this is probably the easiest way to, to understand this. But things that are in the scope of the argument do not strengthen or weaken the argument because they are already in it. So that's the deal. So C doesn't help because C is already addressed. It's not a strength in all we do. Okay. Let's talk about choice A. Choice A says whether the uranium in land is already being depleted. So let's make this the uranium on land is being depleted. The most probable interpretation of that is that it will run out. Because something is rapidly being used up, that means it's going to all be used up. So most probable interpretation of this, it's going to all be gone. So what does that mean if it's all gone? It means you are going to have to get uranium somewhere else, even if it costs more. So what that means then is that this is, even though the cost is high, this will be commercially viable because it'll have to be. You're, you're going to run out of uranium from land. So this is the correct answer to the problem. This one, um, B, we don't care because it doesn't matter where the uranium is used is not relevant to the argument. We don't care who's using it or where it's used. We just care how the market behaves. Um, D, the, the relative amounts are not something that matters because we're, the argument is based on the cost of getting the uranium, not on how much is there to be gotten. And then this one at a cost similar to, meaning that this is just as expensive as seawater is. So if E is true, then freshwater mining has the same problems as seawater mining does. So it doesn't help us. Like we need some way for this to be commercially viable without its cost going down. Because the argument has already allowed that as an exception. Okay, questions, go ahead and type them in the text box. But this is a valuable lesson here. If the argument already accounts for a possibility, then if you introduce that possibility, it doesn't strengthen or weaken the argument. And then someone says A out of scope. A out of scope is good. I mean, remember, we need something that is out of scope. So... Let's see, even if the uranium is dependent, yeah, but we don't care because this is already accounted for in the argument. Like this, I, I, I think, okay, I think the problem with this is that people are still trying to use way too much formal logic. For example, um, okay, let me use, let me write down the argument that I, that I used before. Um, if you say argument says, only you can't drive a Ferrari unless you're rich. So if I say something like 
lots of rich people have Ferraris. This doesn't help. This doesn't matter because it's already been discussed. But if I say something, like, it has to be another reason. So, like, lots of sons or nephews or daughters of Ferrari dealers who are not rich drive Ferraris. Then this weakens the statement. Because this is some other way that you can drive a Ferrari. If you're rich and you drive a Ferrari, who cares? I've already allowed that to happen. So same thing here. If uranium becomes viable because the cost goes down, it doesn't matter. Like the argument says that can happen. So if it happens, it doesn't strengthen or weaken the argument. The argument says it can happen. So this, this, this kind of unless clause means you have to consider other stuff. Okay, um, let's do one more. Let's see if we can sneak one more into the time limit here. Um, yeah, let's see. How about, how about this one? Okay. Try that last one and we'll jam. We gotta get out of here after this. But here is a, this one's a little bit longer, so I'll give you 215. Go for it. Okay, everybody spent two minutes, 15 seconds already, so please indicate an answer of some type. That means we're waiting on Praveen and not many other people. Praveen, that's you. Please indicate something. Okay, here's the answers from the class. All right. So let's talk about it. Remember most probable interpretations, et cetera. So the argument is that the manager argues that overall costs would be unaffected. In other words, that costs will cancel out other costs. So the manager argues that the cost of replacing damaged products, which would be saved by the new packing, Can you guys, okay, can you hear me now? Let's say I got cut off on the, uh, okay. Um, all right, the cost of replacing the damaged products saved by the new packing, that's what the trend says. And the cost of increase of the packing itself. The manager is saying that the these two things are going to cancel each other out. He's saying the cost will essentially remain effect, unaffected. So this will cancel out, says the manager. So anything affecting either of these costs in a unidirectional kind of way so that they wouldn't cancel each other out, that's what, that's what we want. So let's take a look. Um, if you look at what's going on here, we are only talking about through saves own products. So any sort of comparison with other products is not going to help. Like we need to talk about only the products that true save carries. So in other words, comparisons with other companies are irrelevant. And also on top of that, comparisons with other types of products are irrelevant. Because those comparisons don't have anything to do with this comparison. So like other typical electronics products, we don't, TrueSave doesn't carry, according to the statement, 
Truthly doesn't carry typical products. They carry what they carry. So the, the typical products don't matter. Um, same thing, most other products, we don't really care. We just care about their product versus their packing. So this comparison doesn't affect that. On the other hand, if you have damage already present, then this means that you will not save any money on these. In other words, you won't recoup these costs. with the new packing. So that's going to work against the manager's claim because it's going to reduce this effect. It's going to, the manager is just assuming the damage happens in transit. So if the damage doesn't happen while the products are being shipped, then the packing is going to have nothing to do with it. So this is a weakener. If this is a true statement, then it's a weakener. D, we don't care whether the customers blame themselves. I mean, that doesn't matter as far as costs goes. And then performance of the shipping companies, whether they monitor the performance or not, has no direct effect on how much these things cost. So there we go. Most probable interpretation. Any quick questions about this one? Quick being the operative word. We do have to end here in a couple of minutes because we're over time. But if anybody has quick questions, feel free, fire away. Otherwise, um, we are going to close. Um, it's, it's C. Because C is the one that if you, if you actually make this a definitive statement, it becomes a weakener. So. Um, S, were you watching the slide where we talked about that, this, this slide right here? If it produces either one of these effects, then it helps. If it helps to evaluate means it can help you either way. Like if something strengthens, then it helps you. And if something weakens, it also helps you. So either way. All right, um, any other quick questions, shoot away. Otherwise, we are out of here. Um, good stuff. So I'll start logging you guys out in the next 30 seconds or so if there's no questions. All right, you're welcome. Have a great week. Good night and good luck. Um, take it easy. I'll see you guys in two weeks.